always your right hand if you keep a calendar of your daily activity. Keep your hands up, raise your left hand, you will keep a to-do list of your tasks every day. Now keep both of your hands up if you are sure you can finish everything. <laughs> Otherwise, put your hands down. Nobody wow. I myself kept a to-do list for myself. When I was typing these first lines of my talk into my computer, my mind was scrolling through this list. In front of me, there are a few more windows open. The design of the two programs that I was going to, the, to deliver that weekend, the PowerPoint slides of another workshop that I had to conduct the next day, the email that I was going to answer, the book that I was going to read, the blog post that I was going to write, the speech that my friend had just sent me to command on, and to tell me all of the organizers of TEDx Digital Group was messaging me, hey, how is it going? How is it? I was sweating. I told her, it's going well. It's going well. Although, I was only typing these first lines. At the same time, my friend messaged me, hey, we haven't talked for years. I missed you. And I told her, all right, I have been busy. There have been so many commitments lately. And she told me, oh, that's good. Having a lot to do is good. Having nothing to do is truly scary. I immediately stopped. Is that true? Is having nothing to do truly scary? Is that why we always have to do so much to keep a tool on this, so that we always have something to do? There is the research in the US done by Timothy Wilson in 2014. He puts willing participants one by one into an empty room with nothing else, no chairs, no books, no entertainment, no smartphone, no even writing materials. And he asked them to stay in the room for 6 or 15 minutes. And then when they came out of the room, he asked them what they felt about the situation. None of them felt good. None of them felt comfortable because they didn't want to sit down and just think. They thought that it was a waste of time. And the top is all off. He put a small button in the room. When you press that button, there will be a very unpleasant electric shock. Still nothing else. Still no books, still no entertainment, still no writing materials. Now you put one by one the participant into the room. Twelve out of sixteen men push that button. Only six out of twenty-four women push that button, even though it would be unpleasant. Now the first conclusion of this research was women was smaller than men. And the second and the most serious conclusion is many people would rather do something unpleasant to themselves. Would rather do so much that they don't want to stop and think. That was exactly like what my friend was telling me. We were so afraid of our own thoughts that we don't want to stop and just think. We want to do so much because doing will make us feel active, feel happy at the moment. But if you stop doing, we will be afraid that somebody else will run past us, we will lose out of them. Why is that? Can we ask the question, why is that? Because society made us so. In university, we should realize that students who are all organized events just like this. So if we join activities, are regarded as better students. In my university in Singapore, 10 years ago, we even had a point system. Whoever joined more activities, whoever organized more events, we received more points. The higher the rank in the club, the more points. And at the end of the year, we tabulated those scores. Whoever got more scores, would get to stay in the campus in the next year. Now my school was so far away from the city center, it took one and a half hours to get to the campus by bus and by trains. All of us wanted to stay in school, and that was like we fought, we fought, we fought for points. Even until the last semester, the last week of the semester, only then we would stop and we would study the examination coming in the same in the same week. So even in school, our ability to think was already damaged. 
And then there's minions. All you need to do, we came out of the shell. We entered the, the job market. We wanted to find jobs. What is the first thing that came out of our mouth when we came out of the to the society to find jobs? I want to be successful, right? I myself had the same had, had, the, had the same thing whenever I wanted to find jobs. But have we defined what success means to you? I did not. And that is why in my resume there are a whole lot of words such as achievements, organizing, leading, managing, objectives. And the word success was there three times. I dare you to find in a resume of a fresh graduate those words such as I dream to be somebody, I hope to be somebody, my desire, my passion, I want to think, and I want to make this world a better world. No, we cannot find those because the HR managers, they don't care for those words because the companies will only hire fresh graduates to do. They don't hire a fresh graduates to think because to them, thinking is worthless. And that is why our ability to think is damaged even more. And even worse than that, the modern society forced us to be suffered from a mental drug of instant gratification. We must work faster internet must be like acting. Customer service must be quick, especially food must be fast. That is why we are put into a non-stop mode. We always have to run. Back then when I was a small kid, when I wanted to find some answers to that question, I wanted to ask around. I wanted to go to the library to find books. And I had to think, these days, we can find answers with just a few types on the keyboard and press enter and Mr. Google will answer us immediately. We became good searchers, but not good researchers. We became good doers, but not good thinkers. And now our ability to think is destroyed altogether. We became human doings. We are not human beings anymore. We wake up, we watch our tea, we eat breakfast, we beat the traffic to work. We solve problems at work, and then we beat the traffic at home, go back home, we cook dinner, we have dinner, and then we go to bed. There's no time to think at all, because this society has made us so. We have to break away from that cycle. But three years ago, I was exactly that person. I was an engineer, by the way. I graduated from a university in Singapore. I worked as an engineer for seven years. Somehow, I did my engineering so much. And I had to fill up my free time with activities to feel that I'm worthy. Because I did my job, I did where I was to go. I filled up my, my calendar with important meeting, uh, you know, important meeting to conduct, important events to organize, important people to meet. But at the same time, I destroyed my health. I destroyed my relationship with my family. And especially, I destroyed my spirit. Because I didn't know where else to go. I didn't know my passion, I didn't know my purpose. My life was going nowhere. And that, was scary now, but back then I didn't feel so. Back then I was happy because I was proud that I could do so much. And especially my friends. They were good friends. They told me, okay, you know, you're so proud of you because you do so much. That made me work even harder. But today, I'm telling you today, I am saved. Today I don't work so much anymore. Still, I still work. But I have learned how to do nothing. I find I found a way, three simple ways for us to escape from that from that rat race. Don't you want to know? Yes. Alright, thank you very much. And I call that the arts of doing nothing. The first step of doing nothing, very simple. You do nothing every day. That is to spend some time during the day, no matter what, no matter when. Some time during the day. Just to stop doing all together. Shut up the mind, shut up the computer, and sit down and think about your day. No matter how long, maybe five minutes or maybe half an hour, it's up to you. You can meditate, and then you'll think about your life. Just like when we clean the room, our room, right? We have to look at the room to see whether we are happy with the room. 
Yung mga lang. May may something we can discard on the road. For example, that's why I have water that is going away. Maybe that's why we need some fixing. And then, we'll look at the road again to see what else we need to rearrange. Maybe the old page should be put next to the TV. Or maybe the flower pot must be put onto the dining table. And finally, we look at our new needs. Maybe we need a new blender because now we want to bring more juice. Maybe the chair is not comfortable, now we need to buy some cushions. If we can do that for our room, I think we can do the same for our mind too. So it be that few minutes during the day when you do nothing, you think and answer all questions. The first question is, are you happy with your day? If you are not, then the second question is, what can you stop doing to make you happy? Discard all of those activities away. Then the third question, if you are happy with your day, what should be done? What should be continued in the next day to make you happy just the same? And that comes to the, far, to the final and the fourth question during the day. Don't everything you do during your day align with your passion and purpose? Back then, three years ago, I spent maybe a few minutes every day to relax. I just think about my day, and I realized that everything that I did has nothing to do with that, with my happiness, and especially my job. That was alarming. And that's why I came to the final question. Did everything that I do align with my passion and purpose? And they did not. And that is when I came to the second step of doing nothing. You do nothing every year. That is, you spend one to two weeks away from everything that you are doing, goes away far, far away, disconnect yourself from the world, especially go to some mountains or some seaside, and then you spend those one to two weeks with just yourself and think. Everybody has your own way of disconnect yourself from the world to think. I myself prefer not to trick it. And that is why when the previous speaker asked, me, asked us, do you like to travel to the mountain? I raised my hand immediately. Because for me, the mountains is sacred. Every year, I will spend one week to go to some mountain nearby, and then the, the trail up will take one to two days, the trail down will take one to two days as well. That's almost the whole week. And there was only just me, myself, and I was pushing myself step by step to go to the top of the mountain. And within that time, I was able to look back at my life from the purpose of support of you. And I would have to be able to answer two questions. First, if I come back to that life right now, will I feel happy? And the second question is, what else should I do in order to make my life back there happy? So throw out the few times that I've climbed three highest mountains in South Asia already. And during those three times, I realized that I don't not like engineering at all. I dreaded my job. And through the three times, I realized that I only felt happy when I realized I came back to talk to people. I could come back to organize the events. I could come back to train. And that is when I realized that my passion and my purpose is to train. I love training and I love people development. And I love to speak. And that is when I realized that, okay, I'm not born to do engineering. I was born to do training and speaking. And only then I realized my true passion and purpose. So without these, times alone by myself on the mountains, I would not be able to realize my true passion and purpose. And that is the second step. And the third step is to start doing all together and just be. As I told you just now, we became human beings, but we are no longer human beings. And the third step is to set goals to be. Now think about your goals right now. What are they? Perhaps I want to earn $100,000 a year. Perhaps I want to get a great job three months after my graduation. Perhaps I want to get a big house before I was 30 years old. Now all of those goals are great goals because they are smart goals, right? They have specific outcomes. They have specific timeline. They have measurable goals, men to men to measure goals. Now what if you achieve all of those goals already? What's next then? That is a very large question. What's next? Okay, now I earn $100,000 already. Maybe next year, 
$110,000. Now I have a big house, how about a big car? Now I have a good job, how about a promotion next year? All of these new goals are still great goals because they are still smart goals. Don't you think so? I'm sorry, no. It's never ending. <laughs> Whenever we set those goals and we achieve those goals, we always have to increase the number again and again and again. And this is why all the modern companies they work in the same way. They, they, they train us to work in the same way. Okay, this year we work so much. Next year we should increase the revenue by one point five times. That's a lot. We must escape from that trap. Forget all of those hard words together and focus on the big ego instead. Instead of saying, I want to earn $100,000 a year, say, I want to be worth $100,000 a year. Instead of saying, I want to read 10 books every month, say, I want to be learning and inquisitive every month, or every day even. Instead of saying, I want to train 1,000 people, say, I want to be inspirational and motivational every day. Don't you see that the two sides, the interests are the same. But on one side, it forces you to do so much. On one side, it allows you to be a better, to be a better person. On one side, it's doing both. And on one side, it's a being goal. So when I found out that I was passionate about speaking and training, I thought back to myself, OK, so what should I do now? I set my goals to earn my master's degree in training and development. I set my goals to earn my first company in training and development. I said, I'm going to train 1,000 people, but oh, it must keep on coming. It's never stopping. And that is when I decided that, okay, to stop all that. I decided that I would be inspirational every day. I would be understanding every day. I would be caring every day, and I would be perseverance every day. These are my core values, and these are my being goals. With these three simple steps, first, you do nothing every day. Second, you do nothing every year. And now you set your being goals to do nothing altogether, just be a better person. Without these three steps, now I will still be an engineer, sitting in one cubicle somewhere, feeling depressed, and wishing some angel would come and save me from this dark corner. Without these three steps, now I will still be addicted to the world. Of course, I'm not addiction free yet, let me tell you, because a few weeks ago I was still hiding my head off. <laughs> but at least I'm going somewhere. At least I'm trying to master the art of doing nothing. And I want to invite you to do the same, come back home and do the same today. You can start with just five minutes every day. Start doing all together and sit down, just think about your day. Don't you spend a few days every year to go somewhere far, far away, turn off your phone, turn off your network. Go to the mountain, but across the mountain there will be no 3G network. There's no Wi-Fi. You will have no way to contact. And spend that time to think. And finally, set your winning goals. Don't set your winning goals. Don't set the smart goals anymore. Don't trust all the goals out of the So you can set smart goals. Because goals are truly yourself. And, and remember, the bad thing is, we are human beings. We are not human doings. To be or not to be. The choice is yours. Thank you.